Okay, it's been a long year. This is Charlie's Vids, Shilly's Vids, whatever you want to call me, Vids. It's been a long year. I've looked at a lot of shit. We've all seen a lot of shit go on. We've all had information fed to us that was incorrect. We've all hyped shit that didn't happen. We've all been waiting for something that still hasn't happened. What is that? Moas. Now, despite any YouTuber, any Reddit post, any DRS, any computer share, any seller boxing, any hype narrative at all, despite any of that, nothing has happened. So, what should we do? Should we continue listening to the hype train, or should we look now in hindsight before we get too far ahead of ourselves? That's what I'm here for, folks. And now, we're going to take a look at 2021, a year to remember and to learn from, hopefully. Now, this is going to be a straight up blunt as shit video. I'm going to give you my straight up thoughts on what I think happened. I'm going to show you the reasons why. And I would love for a counter argument, less the emotions, please, so we can discuss this. Because this is how I feel. This has been a journey for me. I will never forget this year. I appreciate all the support I've gotten from those of you that have stick, uh, stuck with me all year. I hope you've learned something. And I hope that you're on the same page as I am after listening to me all year. So without further ado, let's get, let's get going. I'll do this in two parts. First, we're going to look into a little bit of the history behind why I think this is all happening today, when it all started, and where it's headed. So tomorrow marks the end of the 2021 year. Tomorrow's the last day. There will likely not ever be another year such as this one with such an opportunity to learn and see what exactly happened this year. Let's go ahead and take a look. Now, it's about time we ask ourselves in hindsight, was there value in the areas I spent my time this year? If the answer is no, you should look back to where you were spending that time and ask the person who you were giving all that time to, did they care about my time? Because at the end of the day, most of these people only want to further their own lives. That's instilled in all of us. It's human nature. So it's always going to be an aspect in a lot of the motives behind some of this content that you're seeing. Now, everyone's different, right? I'm different than, than most people, obviously. I'm retarded. I genuinely care about people. I genuinely care about accurate information. I mean, it is what it is. I'm never going to not tell you how something is just because feelings, that is not the way to do things in my opinion. So, again, you all know that very well by now. Now, again, it's all about your time. Time is money, money is time. Your time is the most valuable thing to me. That's why I keep my videos short, to the point, and hopefully educational. Now, I will tell the story of 2021 how I see it after all the research, hard work, and effort that I've put in this year. So let's go ahead and take a look at my retarded look on everything. The beginning. 1970s, the first derivatives in today's market. Starting in the 1970s and increasingly in the 1980s and 90s, the world became a riskier place for the financial institutions. Swings in interest rates widened and the bond and stock markets went through some episodes of increased volatility. As a result of these developments, managers of financial institutions became more concerned with reducing the risk their institutions faced, not thinking about the risks it would cause for everything else. Given the greater demand for risk reduction, the process of financial innovation came to the rescue by producing new financial instruments that helped financial institution managers manage risk better. These instruments, called derivatives, have payoffs that are linked to previously issued securities and are extremely useful risk reduction tools. Yeah, so they thought. Now, aided by deregulation and the rise of computers, the first major options exchanges opened in the 1970s, followed by a wave of derivatives exchanges around the world in the 1980s and early 1990s. Today, the derivatives market is worth $710 trillion, or perhaps $1.2 quadrillion, or perhaps some other amount that is larger than the world's GDP. That is the problem and the scope of what we're dealing with here. That is why nothing has happened, because it literally can't, not even that much money exists in the world. So, without making it magically disappear, not sure how they're going to get out of this one. But, again, they like to commit crime. Now, derivatives were created in the 70s, as we know them today. They, they, they date way further back, like Aristotle back in the day, um, if you want to look into the history about that. But as far as what we know them as in these, in these exchanges, computerized exchanges, it all started 
with the Fearsome Foursome IPO and, and Bank of America and Salomon Brothers back in the 70s. Basically, they bet on customer and consumer credit for the first time, and um, here we are, uh, 1.2 quadrillion later, <laughs> in a nutshell. Of course, there's more into it than that, but I don't want to make this video three hours long. So we move along after the derivatives were created in the 1970s. You had Walter Bloomberg working for Salomon back then. Then you have the 1980s come in. Now, this is the rise of Salomon, okay? They were already one of the leading banks at the time. This is when they became one of the biggest players in Wall Street. They had their CEO was the king of Wall Street. Um, so yeah, black and economist Myron Scholes, who later went to Salomon Brothers, hit upon a way for investors to determine whether a stock option was cheap, expensive, or fairly priced. Funny enough, I, even in my own effing trading strategy, I'm using this tool, this is something we're using in the group, to know if we're, our options that we're buying are, are fairly priced. So it's funny, Salomon, you can't escape them. Um, it's the, the, the Black Shoals model. There is a calculator that the OCC website offers you can use. It's a very easy way to price options. So basically all the investor has to do is plug into the Black Shoals equation these variables. Current prices of the stock and option, the price at which the option can be exercised, the time to expiration, and the mark, market rate of interest. Other notable alumni from Salomon Brothers, by the way, if you want to see more info on this, I have a ton of videos on Salomon Brothers on my channel. Don't want to regurgitate too much of that here. But notable alumni, you have Michael Bloomberg, Rob Gensler, which is Gary Gensler's twin brother, the SEC chair, David Solomon, who is the current CEO of Goldman Sachs, Michael Lewis, a uh, big short writer, Lewis Ranieri, I believe he helped to create the first mortgage-backed security, which led to the financial crisis of 08. And then, of course, Warren Buffett, who was made CEO after coming in to clean up after Salomon Brothers in the late 80s when they got caught in their bond scandal. Now, speaking of that, they were caught in a scandal. They were trying to corner the treasury market, by the way. And uh, in 1988, this is when they purchased WTC7 and renovated it, removing entire floors and installing diesel generators on floor 5. They occupied this space with the SEC, the CIA, the Secret Service, and the IRS. Call me a conspiracy nut, whatever, but it feels like that's the beginning of the cover-up story that we're living today. Obviously, that's a little bit out there, but I do have some more research on that on the channel uh, somewhere in there <laughs> that backs that up. Uh, other notable alumni. Uh, yeah, by the way, Citadel, their technology literally came from Tom Miglis, partnered with, with Ken Griffin in early 2000s. Um, to basically implement the technology we see today. Put that twice, don't know why. Michael Stockman, currently at MF Global. You have a lot of other people at MF Global. You got people at Citigroup, you got people at JP Morgan. Jamie Dimon actually helped with the merger of Salomon and Travelers Group, creating Salomon Smith Barney, which is the underwriter for GameStop. That's where I was going with this, if you didn't know that already. And then you also had John Bass, who left for Citigroup after the merger that happened in 1999. Now, this is proof of the claim I made earlier about WTC7 and the tenants in the building. So that's cool. This is the floor here where the generators were installed. These floors here were removed. Now, 1980s, the rise of Salomon. During the late 80s, Salomon had become the biggest firm on Wall Street, the most powerful firm on Wall Street, and had ties to the Fed, very, very close to the Fed. In the late 1980s, Salomon was caught in a scandal trying to corner the bond market. This is, in my opinion, what kickstarted everything that we've experienced in 2021 as they called in Warren Buffett to clean up after Salomon as this was the very first time the public was aware and caught wind of the potential corruption on Wall Street. So obviously they wanted to keep that under wraps and they would do everything in their power to cover this up, in my opinion. And by the way, our very own Jerome Powell, the current Fed chair, was the mofo who was in charge of the proceedings for Salomon's crimes. The fine... $100,000. Good job, Jerome. Keep raising that debt ceiling. Now, we have an annual shareholder meeting, and at 86 years old, it seems like Warren Buffett has been in the spotlight forever, but that necessar hasn't necessarily been the case. Miles, you're actually writing a story on the moment that America met Warren Buffett. When exactly was that? Yeah, so um, obviously people in the investing world have known about Buffett for a long time, but if we go back to 1991, uh, a young Warren Buffett, I believe he was 61 at the time, uh, was <laughs> kind of young. Yeah, right. Um, he came before uh, a House subcommittee. Uh, he had been installed as the interim chairman and CEO of Solomon Brothers, which is a New York investment bank that he had a large investment in. Uh, they had a scandal with rigging treasury bids, and so Buffett stepped up and sort of took the hit. 
uh, came before Congress and delivered uh, really one of his most famous um, you know, little speeches. I guess it was only a couple minutes. Uh, but that was sort of the moment that Warren Buffett kind of cemented his uh, mythology, I guess, or the, the myth of Warren Buffett began, right? This Midwestern guy coming in to, to defend, uh, you know, the New York investment. And he actually had some really poignant lines during his testimony. We actually have a clip here from 1991 when he was testifying before Congress. Lose money for the firm and I will be understanding. Lose a shred of reputation for the firm and I will be ruthless. I welcome your questions. So, yeah, he was the only guy that America would have accepted to come in and clean up after Salomon Brothers because he was this old dude. Everyone loved him. It was perfect. The perfect puppet. Now, 1990s, Salomon Scatter. After the hearing, the CEO at the time was replaced by Warren Buffett, obviously, and Salomon alumni quickly dispersed around the globe into many other banking companies around the world. As for Salomon itself, it was acquired by Travelers Group in the late 90s, and that same year, Travelers Group became a part of Citicorp, which would later become Citigroup Global Markets, effectively burying Salomon inside of the Citigroup infrastructure to escape its bad reputation. Now, Salomon Smith Barney, after the merger with Citigroup, was the investment banking arm before being renamed after the 08 crisis. So Salomon Smith Barney, again, um, yeah, they're, they're basically Salomon Brothers, Citigroup, dispersed. Now, the Glass-Steagall Act was lifted in, the in 1998, which merged commercial banking and investment banking back together, the event that led to all of the mergers and powerhouses that we likely see today. Okay, I guess I just changed the title on that one. Okay, so obviously we know what happened in 2001. We don't need to go over that here because I'll get you more shadow banned. But just an interesting fact around that, Michael Bloomberg uh, was supposed to have his first primary um, on that day. So, for the New York mayor, which he later got. And then four months later, GameStop's IPO was born. Now, fast forward, right? If you want to look at what happened in between, I have all this shit on my channel. Go look at it. But this is the year to remember. We all remember this year for one thing. January 28th. What happened? <clears throat> they took the buy, the buy button away, right? They sure did. Well, I wanted to show you something. Just, just I want to show you my thought process. Now, some people say this is doesn't show anything, but I, but I, I disagree. Because your argument doesn't have anything better. So, I mean, th I feel like this is a great way to test the waters of media narratives. So what we're seeing here is I'm basically searching for news articles that were published. I just put the word GameStop in, the search bar, between January, 20, or January 1st and, and January 28th. Okay? Th there's about 30 pages or so. But the majority of them were posted on January 28th and January 27th. So before those two days, the majority of them were not there. So it's almost like if you look at the data, which we're about to do, from all sides, they chose this day to attack. I don't know if the buy button taken away was planned or not, but what you'll see here in a second is that it was an attack, clearly. I mean, this is a shit ton. And this isn't like Metzler. These are reputable news companies, not some rando website created last week. These are real name websites. It's attack by info, over info, deception. So are you here by choice? Are we here by choice? Or are you here because it was made to look like it's where you were supposed to be? That is a question that needs to be asked, and I don't hear anyone asking it. The data is concerning once you look at it. <clears throat> but, again, it is what it is. So, now we're going to look at Google Trends. Think what you will. This is reality. January. Boom, boom. Went up, went down. Flat. What happened in June? Another uptrend. Boom. Went up trailed off. If anything, this one does not look organic. This looks more organic. At this point in the year, the market was already decaying to the point where there was probably no liquidity left to short ladder like that. So, clearly, perception is playing against us here. The reason they move together in every aspect of everything is because they're controlled together. This is Wall Street bets. 
Look at their posts per day. Look at their top keywords, which I X'd out and put tracking numbers because that's basically what they are. Autists and fucktards. Excuse my language, but you know what I mean. It's th This is the virtue signaling phrases right here that everyone bites on. And it's not anyone's fault. I'm not calling anyone out specifically. I'm just saying this is how it is, and I'm, I'm trying to make discussion about it, but no one even wants to have it because they're so intent on the narrative being fulfilled, the prophecy. Now, January 28th, the day of infamy. What was so special about the day? Again, they took the, the buy button away, yeah. Was that the day that trading was halted, ultimately? Uniting the apes for our battle against Wall Street? Or was that the day an attack was initiated on a psychological level, the likes of which have never been seen before in all of human history? I'm starting to lean towards the latter. Now, does that mean I'm not a believer in GameStop? Absolutely not. Not at all. But again, it is what it is. Decide for yourself, man. That's that's the point. Now, another couple of concerning points. Top commenters by frequency. Uh, you slash has been deleted has a 2982 frequency score, and the next closest to him is only 11. That's concerning. Media narrative control. Obviously, the top link domains. You have Bloomberg, Business Insider, Finance, Yahoo, Wall Street Journal, Fox Business, Forbes, Market, Business Insider, and CNBC and the New York Times, which I forgot to list on here. Those are, and Reuters. These are your media narrative control vehicles. These are your deceptive content reproduction vehicles. You have Wall Street Bets, Reddit, Reddit, Twitter, YouTube, Mobile Twitter, Streamlabs. It's just how it works. It's what they're doing. It's psychological warfare. They they create deceptive content and disseminate it to YouTubers who, who take it and then redistribute that deceptive content in hopes to gain more views for their channel, more exposure to better their lives. It's just a human process. Here's your reality mixed in there. Those are your two options of reality. So while there is some hope, it's very, very small. Everything else here is bullshit. And it's just been used as vehicles to regurgitate nonsense. Now, again, uh, you all well know by now that I used to do sales because all the shills tr who tried to dox me, which, by the way, doxing someone holding an award is not doxing somebody. That's basically confirming that I work hard. So congrats. You did it. But you know who doesn't work hard? These people. You know why? They all do the same shit. Feed you shit they don't understand. Feed you shit that sounds good. And feed you shit that they know you will buy. Now, do I like shitting on everyone's parade? Absolutely not. But someone has to, because there's money involved here. And if, you know, and especially the time that's being given to some of these people who would just clearly have no idea what they're talking about because they haven't done the work. And that is all there is to it. Does it mean they're bad people? No. Does it mean that they're evil? No. A lot of them may not even know the consequences of their actions. It's just human nature to want to take the easy way out. And that's not me. So, and that never will be me. I'll never make thumbnails like this because it's not reality. It's how they get you. It's how they lure you in. It's how they get your time. And the real question needs to be asked this year. Was the time you spent worth it? And my goal this year has been to, to make that answer, if you've been with me this whole year, to look back on it and say, yes, I feel like it was worth it because I learned something. So again, not trying to be an asshole, just trying to be real, people. I mean, we got to stop letting the emotions cloud our judgment and make the right calls because YOLO, baby. Just because Moas, you know, may or may not be like a real thing, may or may not been created or, you know, a narrative. The fact is, it could be real. It could not be real. We don't know because it hasn't happened yet. We know the DDs out there. We know the possibilities there. But we also know the people we're up against have unlimited capability to commit crime. Now, does that mean we should give up hope? No. Instead of hope, turn that hope and manifest it into something where you can learn and get something out of it. Because at the end of the day, hope is good and nice and everything, but it doesn't get you anything. What gets you stuff is learning and putting that learning to work and then making money off of it. No, these markets, there's money to be made here, people. There's 
$1.7 trillion stuffed in a repo market every day. There's money to be made here. So just hang in there, everyone. Next year is going to be crazy. This year has been crazy. I'm not going to win anywhere. I'm not changing how I've done things at all. I will continue next year just like I did this year. And uh, again, appreciate the support. And um, yeah, you all have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day today. And uh, let's just get through tomorrow. One more day. Have a good one.